Hey guys, I'm continuing on from other doctors of theology that are explaining biblical repentance uh, and true salvation, which is faith alone in the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day according to scriptures. Uh, and how it isn't faith plus works. It's either faith in what Jesus did alone or you're trusting in yourself. I've always said that. Um, and most of the church here is trusting in their own righteousness, forsaking God. So I'm going to read you something from chapter four of Dr. Hiles' book, Jack Hiles, The Enemies of Soul Winning. All right. Um, over and over again, the question is asked me, is repentance necessary for salvation? Of course, this is of the utmost importance. Anything that deals with the way a person can escape the fires of eternal hell and go to heaven to live forever is of vital importance. In this chapter, we'll address this most important question. Number one, first, we need to find out what makes one lost. Please notice John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's very plain in this verse what makes a person lost. Notice the words, he that believeth not is condemned already. A person who does not believe is condemned. So not believing is what makes a person lost. Thank you. I've said all the other sins of the world were nailed to the cross. You have to receive it by faith. Bear in mind the word believing in the Greek word means to rely upon. Okay? When you're believing on Christ, you're trusting what he did, his sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection alone, God in the flesh, who bodily raised from the dead. Okay, this is me. This is not what he's saying. That's believing on him, trusting what he did alone. Okay? When one believes on Christ, he simply relies on him to save him and take him to heaven when he dies. It's very plain here that what a person that condemns a person to hell is not believing then notice it says because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten son of god once again we're told what makes a person lost because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of god it's as simple as that now look at john 3 36 he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life and that life begins the moment you believe not when you die okay because you have eternal life and jesus is eternal life you see so you have Jesus, and he's eternal life, and you get him the moment you believe on him. You see? All right, that was me adding to. All right. Now it says, and he uh, that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Who's the wrath abide on? Those who believe not the Son. Okay? Not those who don't know how to get their sin control managed. All right, we are trying to decide and determine what makes one lost. It's very plain here. Notice the word believeth, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. What keeps a person from seeing life? Believing not. What makes the wrath of God uh, abide on a person? Believing not. So what must a person repent in order to be saved? He must repent of that which makes him lost, since believing not makes him lost, believing makes him saved. In repentance, there is a turning from the thing that keeps him from being saved to the thing that saves him. So, yes, there is a repentance from unbelief and whatever else you're trusting in. Okay, a pagan god, a false religion, but that's unbelief. That's not believing in Christ, you see. It's also repenting of your dead works, as in Hebrews. Relying on uh, the law, you being good to save yourself. But then again, that's unbelief, isn't it? Because you're not believing on Christ. So, believing makes him saved. In repentance, there is a turning from the thing that keeps him from being saved to the thing that saves him. So yes, there is a repentance from unbelief in order to believe. It is simply a change of direction. It means turning around. It means a change of mind. You are going away from believing and you decide to turn around and believe. You change your direction. You change your mind. With your will, you believe and rely upon Christ to save you. In order to believe, you have to repent of unbelief. That's what makes a man lost and it must be corrected. Because the wrong definition of repentance is adding works. All right. Now turn to John 540. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Oh, how simple this is, and yet how plain. Why does a person not have life according to this verse? Because he won't come to Christ. So if a person is going away from Christ, he must turn around and come to Christ, which is a change of direction or a change of mind. This is repentance. Repenting of the thing that keeps one from being saved. Repenting of going away to coming to. That's why I said I didn't call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance, to turn towards Christ as Savior, okay? Because the righteous don't need him, but there is none righteous. That's the whole sarcastic point. Notice Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Who did he lay it upon? Jesus Christ. Especially notice his words. We have turned everyone to his own way. 
that's what not being saved is, turning to your own way. Now, if we turn to God's way, which is putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we turn around from going our own way to going his way, from unbelief to belief. This is biblical repentance. Bear in mind, it is the faith that saves. The turning around is necessary to put our faith in Christ. One must repent from that thing that keeps him from being saved in order to be saved. If a person were saved by good works, then he would have to repent of bad works or not doing good works in order to be saved. If a person were saved by quitting his sinning, then he would have to repent of his sinning in order to be saved. A person is saved by believing, so he repents of his unbelief or turns from his unbelief in order to be saved. Let us look at the verses that teach we're saved by belief. John 3, 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, they mock God's power unto salvation as easy believism. But if God tells you to believe, whether it's hard or easy, it's belief, okay? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That life does not end, okay? I'm sick of people saying you can lose something that you didn't earn. John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, and he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Acts 13, 16, 31, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and the house. He went and preached to all of the household. There are those who say we have to repent of our sins in order to be saved. No, we have to repent only of the thing that makes us unsaved, and that's unbelief, not trusting what Jesus did on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. The right Jesus, the Word who became flesh, God in the flesh, who bodily rose from the dead and paid a sin penalty for us. If a person needs to turn from his sins in order to be saved, what sins does he turn from? Does he start turn from pride? Does he turn from selfishness? Does he turn from covetousness? The truth is nobody can turn from all of his sins until he is raptured and receives a body like the body of the Savior. 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. According to Psalms 19.12, we do not even know of all of our sins. David said, cleanse thou me from secret faults. I've said before the sins, we don't know about these people. Self-righteous, it's crazy. What he is talking about here is being cleansed from faults. He doesn't even know he has. A person, when he's first saved, doesn't even know all the things he's doing that are wrong. And if a person has to repent of all his sins, where is growth in grace? Growing in his grace. I've said that. And I've said that a changed life and living in less Overt sin is spiritual maturity, not salvation. Where is being a babe in Christ? Where does the carnal Christian fit in here? Now, don't misunderstand me. I am certainly for separation and for living a godly life. So am I. Do I fail? Of course I do. But the cleansing of our lives is not done by us any more than salvation is done by us. Salvation is simply repenting of unbelief and believing and letting Christ save us. We yield to him to save us. He does. Immediately, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. The Holy Spirit begins his work of cleansing in our lives. He is the one who cleanses just as he is the one who saves. He is the one that points our sins out to us after we're saved. He's the one that saves us when we're saved. That's what I'm trying to say. When you add this works, this turning from sin to salvation, it's an accursed gospel. And the Holy Spirit doesn't come because Christ isn't lifted up as the one and only Savior. And all his work alone is what saves us. You see? So now this person is going to struggle in their flesh. And they're going to think their salvation has something to do with their changed life. When I've said if the real gospel was preached and grace came into them, you want to serve him. But they don't trust God's grace to do it. They insist on you, like my friend Paul says, painting the cocoon. But God wants to fix the inside. Fix all the mush so they can turn into a butterfly. He gets to the root of it. Okay, we have to let God's process. Peter talks about that. All right, the stewardess comes and says, Mr. Hiles, what are you doing back here? I say, I'm just cutting up a little bit. <laughs> what? It's funny. Uh, he's, he's talking about this. He's dictating it. To, uh, he's dedicating it to San Antonio. He said, tomorrow morning I catch a plane for Chicago. Suppose I get on that plane. I'm trusting the pilot to take me to Chicago. I do not know how to operate the plane, nor do I, nor do I know the route to Chicago by air. There's nothing I can do to get myself to Chicago by that plane. I trust the pilot to get me there. So we get up in the air, thousands of feet, and let's suppose I get a knife and cut up the seat in front of me. Now where am I going? I'm still going to Chicago. Why? I repented of not trusting the plane to take me to trusting the plane to take me, even though I tore the plane up. And then he says, uh, the stewardess says, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm just cutting up a little bit. 
Then suppose I reach up and cut off a lock of her hair. Now where am I going? I'm still going to Chicago. Because I have, uh, do I have to behave on the flight? No, behaving on the flight doesn't determine your destination. I keep saying, believe, not behave. So the stewardess goes to the pilot and says, Mr. Hiles back in seat 14A is causing some disturbance. Look at my hair. Go back and look at the seat. The pilot leaves the plane and hands to the co-pilot. Says, Mr. Hiles, what are you doing back here? He looks at the seat I've cut up, all the mess he's made, and the lock of hair I cut off the stewardess, and I reach out and cut off his tie. Now where am I going? I'm still going to Chicago. <laughs> That was all determined when I got on the airplane. Now, the truth is, I will not enjoy Chicago as much as I would have enjoyed it, nor will I go to the part of Chicago I planned, but I'm still going to Chicago. Yeah, you're right. He's probably going to go to jail. Doesn't matter. See, there's earthly judgment for disobedience, okay? When we put our faith and trust in Christ and repent of unbelief and believe, God's Holy Spirit comes to live in us and begins to straighten us out. He points out our sins, and we yield to him. He cleanses us from our sins. If we misbehave on the journey, we're still going to heaven because we go to heaven by trusting Christ to take us there. The Holy Spirit who came and lived in us begins to point out things we should and should not do. If we do not obey him, if we misbehave on the journey, we still go to heaven. We simply will not enjoy it as much as we would have had we behaved, just as I would not enjoy Chicago as much as if I'd behaved. Okay? It, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. You can repent of something other than sin. Matthew 7, 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I said uh, on a video called Judas repented, even made restitution and still dropped into hell. Okay, because he didn't repent of the thing he needed to repent of and that was unbelief in who Christ was. Notice that Judas repented. Now, what does it mean? It means he repented about keeping the money. He sold our Savior for 30 pieces of silver. He changed his mind and took the silver back. A change of mind, a change of direction, direction took place, but had none to do with salvation. He made a bad deal. He regretted it. He made that bad deal and tried to correct it. Everybody who lives in sin eventually repents, but they do not repent of unbelief. They changed their mind about sin. No one lives in sin without realizing later that it did not bring the joy, happiness, peace, and contentment it claimed to bring. I, I said before, you know, I don't, my job isn't to tell you, don't abuse his grace, you better not sin. It's to give you the real gospel and let God do his work in you because I know you're going to be miserable if you don't live for the Lord. He'll bring you in line, okay? I just trust him. I talk to people every week who are tired of their sins. I get the same thing, man. People are going, I just struggle with this sin. They know it's sinful. They don't love their sin like we're accused of unhappy in their sinful life or living a miserable wretched life because of the results of sin what have they done they changed their mind about sin and in some cases they even quit their sin at least the sin which was most predominant in their life you can repent of sin without repenting of unbelief and such was the case of judas no doubt he repented that he had done wrong he certainly repented of the bad deal he made he turned around changed his mind brought the money back but he did not repent of that thing that we must repent of in order to be saved and that is unbelief. I've showed you before that God repents all the time. He changes his mind in the Bible. And Genesis says, They repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him in his heart. In Samuel. And it said, uh, these are all examples of God repenting. I've given them to you a ton of times. So I wanted to tell you, whenever it says to repent of some kind of wickedness or something you're doing, it's directed to God's people. Okay, he's guiding us in how to live a righteous life because we're already saved. And it says that judgment comes on the house of God first. Earthly, physical, temporal judgment comes to God's house first. Why? Because we won't be judged with the world. Okay, it says that. The world will be judged for sin because they wouldn't believe. So all their sins are on their account in eternity. Okay. Revelation 2, 5, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come to thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of this place unless you repent. That's him removing their purpose, okay? Here's a case of a church that was a good church. It was a church that worked. It worked hard. It hated sin. It was doctrinally sound. Revelation 2, 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou can't bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. It was a patient church, a church that believed in the name of Jesus and did not faint in their standing for that. Revelation 2, 3, and thou hast born and has had patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. However, it was a church that left its first love. It does not say that church lost its first love, but they left their first love. Okay, when you lose something, you don't know where it is. When you leave something, you know where to find it. It does not say that this church did not love anymore. The truth is they did love. Love is what made them faithful. It made them work made them have patience it was a church of people who love god but they left their first love 
maybe more shallow than the love they had then. It didn't say they loved him less. The truth is they probably loved him more, but God is saying, I want both. I want the deep, mature love you have now and the sweet, expressive love you used to have. The only sin in this church had committed was the sin of leaving their first love. And, and um, nevertheless, they did sin, and God told them to repent. Repent from what? Repent from drinking? No. Repent from adultery? No. This is not the subject. It's repenting from not loving Christ with the first love. The same repentance was commanded to the church in Pergamos, okay? Uh, this is a long video. I didn't realize it was going to take this long. Let me read this last part here. Let us review as follows. God says to the unsaved, repent of your unbelief. It's very interesting in 1 John, the word repentance is never mentioned yet on purpose. Of 1 John was to give people the assurance of salvation. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Of course, repentance is certainly implied through the book because the book tells us that what saves us is believing on Christ or relying on to save us, which of course implies the person must repent of what makes them lost, which is unbelief. Number two, God says to the saved people to repent of those sins, okay? And this is done by the Holy Spirit as he comes to live to remind us to take the clothes off the bedpost and the shirt off the chair and put the shoes in the closet and do all the good things, okay? But none of that saves you. That's our reasonable service Paul talks about, okay? And we fail in that, and Christ ever liveth to make intercession for us. All right, three, if a person must repent of his sins to be saved, of what sins? Because he can't repent of all of them. That's sinless perfection or holiness. Isn't that salvation by works? Of what sin must one repent? He must repent of the sin that makes him lost, and that is the sin of unbelief. For if turning from sins would get you saved, then turning back to sins would get you lost. See what I said? You can't lose what you didn't earn. Acts 16.30, the very simple question is asked, what must I do to be saved? This is the one time in the Bible where this question is asked. Now, the answer to this question must be what saves a person. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And the house, there's the answer, belief. There's nothing about repenting from sins, except there's something about repentance because you can't believe without repenting of unbelief, okay? If a person, number five, if a person has to clean up his own life before he gets saved, we are back to Arminianism or salvation by works. Number six, we cannot do what the Holy Spirit can do. The Holy Spirit first convicts us of our sin of unbelief to bring us to Christ. You know, it showed, the law showed us to be guilty before God and gives us, as a schoolmaster, to come to Christ, okay? Once he brings us to Christ, he comes in to live. Romans 8, 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 1 Corinthians, what? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, he's reminding of you of your identity, that you were already crucified with Christ. Okay, the flesh is technically alive, but we know it's going to die away. Okay, but the new man, the reborn man who cannot commit sin, dwells within. So he's telling you, feed that one. Feed that spirit, not the dead flesh. Okay. When the Holy Spirit is in us, he begins to convict us of things in our lives that should be changed. Then the Christian life becomes a constant repenting until we wake in the likeness of Christ, okay? But the thing is, we don't focus on the law. We don't get under condemnation or fear that we're not really saved. That's crazy. See, we have to enter into his rest in order to live for him. If we're in constant fear, it, it, how do we glorify him? How can you share the good news with somebody if you're not even sure it really is good news? Okay, we have to... Be aware that it isn't us. So I'm hoping this uh, doctor explained it as well for you. Okay? Bye.